want a war? You're gonna get one. Knock it the gods with the drugs from my generation. I'll take the fall. The saints, not cross the nation, daddy. <laughs> Welcome back to Reliving the War and welcome to the 8th of July 1996. It's the night after Bash at the Beach and the wrestling world is buzzing about what happened in Daytona Beach. We have got a lot to get through today so let's first take a look at the pay-per-view results. Bash at the Beach, live from Daytona Beach on July 7th 1996, would turn out to be one of WCW's most important events of the Monday Night War thanks to its infamous main event. The show kicked off with Rey Mysterio pinning Psychosis, another fine display of cruiserweight action that the WWF truly lacked around this time period. John Tenta and Big Bubba had their Carson City Silver Dollar match, there was a sock full of silver dollars hanging from this fucking gigantic pole that neither Big Bubba nor John Tenta would ever climb. Jimmy Hart was like a little spider monkey when he retrieved the sock but Tenta managed to retrieve the quarters from Jimmy and Big Bubba got hit. Tenta wins the match. The taped fist match was up next, DDP vs Jim Duggan. Dallas Page's ring was on the line and the match ended with Page kicking the middle rope while Duggan climbed into the ring. Page then hit the diamond cutter for the pinfall victory. After the bout, Duggan taped his fist and Dallas got nailed. A dog collar match between the Nasty Boys and the Public Enemy followed and you'd think this would have got a little promotion on Nitro but no, it's a random stipulation match thrown right in the middle of the card. The Nasty Boys got the win. Dean Malenko vs Disco Inferno would turn out to be one of Disco Inferno's best ever matches and it actually surprised a lot of people. Malenko got the win with a powerbomb followed by a Texas Cloverleaf, the Iceman retains the cruiserweight title. Steve Mongo McMichael defeated Joe Gomez next and Mongo was totally exposed here. With no tag partners, Mongo had to work an entire 6 minute match and his lack of experience became painfully obvious as the match continued on. Towards the end of the bout, he and Gomez just kinda rolled about and looked at each other. And to add insult to injury, Mongo won the match with a tombstone pile driver. Brutal but oddly entertaining. Ric Flair then defeated Conan for the US title in the next matchup thanks to Elizabeth and Woman. Slick Rick looked delighted to leave Daytona as the new US champ, but his fellow horsemen weren't so fortunate in their match. The Giant and the Taskmaster defeated Benoit and Anderson when Double A took a choke slam. After the bout, Benoit continued attacking Kevin Sullivan, and Woman came down to the ring to try and stop the Crippler, something that confused fans in attendance. Benoit finally stopped his assault when the Giant came back to the ring. And then it was time for the hostile takeover match. Nash Hall and the mystery third man against Lex Luger, Sting and Randy Savage. Mean Gene interviewed the outsiders at the beginning of the match trying to find some answers about the third man but Hall and Nash said they have enough right now to take care of business. The outsiders wrestled this match without the third man but Lex Luger was also taken out pretty early on so essentially it's a normal 2 on 2 tag team match. Nash hits a low blow when Savage signals for the elbow drop and then Hulk Hogan comes to the ring. It looked like Hogan was there to help his old friend Randy Savage but Hogan hits the Macho Man with a leg drop as Bobby Heenan screams that Hulk Hogan is the third man. More leg drops follow and fans witness something they thought they had never seen. Hulk Hogan just turned heel and it was an absolutely brilliant move. You guys know by watching this show every week that Hogan had become incredibly stale. This move right here gave Hogan's career a real shot in the arm. As fans throw garbage into the ring, Mean Gene gets an interview with the Hulkster and Hulk says he got bored with WCW. Hogan says for two years he held his head high and he done a lot of work for kids and charities but because of the reactions Hogan had gotten from WCW fans, he decided to go to the dark side. The Hulkster says Hall and Nash are the future, Hall and Nash are the new blood 
and the New World Organization is taking over. Yeah, he forgot the name of the faction here. So it all changes from this point. The NWO are now part of WCW programming, and the rivalry between NWO and WCW would take center stage for the foreseeable future. Nitro is live tonight from Disney's MGM Studios in Orlando, Florida, now known as Disney's Hollywood Studios. The location sure does give Nitro a unique feel and look, and credit to Eric Bischoff for moving Nitro around and giving the show these different backdrops. In comparison, the raw tapings from Green Bay, Wisconsin look very dull and bleak. Nitro's first 60 minutes then, Shivani and Sabisco talk about how shocked they are that Hulk Hogan turned his back on WCW, and Larry Sabisco, in particular, is absolutely disgusted. After a brief recap of a few Bash at the Beach matches, the in-ring action begins with Rey Mysterio Jr. vs Dean Malenko, and this one was absolutely brilliant. Go out of your way to watch this one. Malenko began toying with Mysterio towards the end of the match. The Iceman had a few chances to end the bout, but Mysterio surprises his opponent with a head scissors to Frankensteiner transition, Ray gets the pinfall win and Ray becomes the new WCW Cruiserweight Champion. Again, if you like to go back and watch matches after watching Reliving the War, this one should definitely be at the top of your list this week. A fine example of how the Cruiserweights of WCW were simply in a league of their own when it comes to in-ring performances. The Steiners and the Nasty Boys then get interviewed by Mean Gene Okerlund. The two teams will face each other tonight and the winners will face Harlem Heat for the tag titles at Hogwild, WCW's next pay-per-view. The Blue Bloods got a win over Hugh Morris and Big Bubba. It was a short match, John Tanta came out and he attacked Big Bubba and this left Hugh Morris all alone. Dave Taylor ended up getting the pinfall win. Psychosis and Eddie Guerrero then had another fantastic cruiserweight match next and during the match Rey Mysterio appeared via split screen talking about how disappointed he was in Hulk Hogan. Kind of weird that it was Rey Mysterio Jr showing his displeasure here but I think they wanted to show how it was affecting the whole locker room, even the relatively new guys. Guerrero got the win after hitting a frog splash. It was fast paced, high flying action here and again another fine display of unique wrestling that the WWF simply didn't offer at the time. The Dungeon of Doom then got interviewed at the entranceway and Mean Gene wants to know what Jimmy Hart thinks about Hulk Hogan's heel turn. Jimmy Hart says he's lost for words and he has no comment. Kevin Sullivan said that he and the Dungeon of Doom have lived for the destruction of Hulkamania and Hulk Hogan took away the mission of the Dungeon of Doom by ending Hulkamania himself. The Giant though is keeping his cool about the whole thing. The Giant says as long as he's the WCW champion, nothing can go wrong. Rick and Scott Steiner then defeated the Nasty Boys, Colonel Robert Parker and Sensational Sherry made an appearance and Parker hit Sags on the head with his cane, allowing the Steiners to pick up the win. Quite a confusing ending here, but I'm sure all will be revealed soon. The Nasty Boys cut a really incoherent promo afterwards, and Mean Gene actually cut Sags off because his promo was going absolutely nowhere. Nob says that the Nasty Boys don't condone what Hogan did, but they don't see anything wrong with it either. Yeah, that makes a lot of fucking sense. The audience were too busy watching the Disney fireworks go off here, and you can't blame them either. It's a win for the fireworks this week on Reliving the War. This was an excellent first 60 minutes of WCW wrestling though, and really, we have the cruiserweights to thank for that. Nitro gets the unopposed hour point this week. Well, after all that crispy WCW action, let's see what the World Wrestling Federation did to respond. The show opens up with Gorilla Monsoon telling us that the Ultimate Warrior is suspended indefinitely. Not the kind of thing the WWF wanted to announce, especially at this very time, but it looks like they had no choice. Warrior was advertised for some house shows and he didn't appear, and the World Wrestling Federation have legitimately suspended Jim Helwig until he can post an appearance bond, so the WWF wanted Warrior to pay a hefty fine. Because Raw is taped, the Warriors match will still be shown on tonight's program. 
But yeah, that was it for The Warrior. He wouldn't be associated with the WWE again until his Hall of Fame induction in 2014. The Warriors match with Owen Hart is shown first on Raw, while Nitro moves on with a Jim Powers vs Ric Flair match. The commentary during this episode of Raw has been redubbed in places, so McMahon and Lawler can talk about Warriors suspension, and the commentators speculate that this could be the very last time we see the Warrior in a WWF ring. McMahon, to his credit, still puts Warrior over and he hopes Warrior will do the right thing and pay his suspension fee. But Jerry Lawler couldn't care less. Lawler tells the viewers to set their VCRs because this could very well be the last time we ever see the Ultimate Warrior. I never really cared much for the Warrior, but even I'll admit that this came at an extremely bad time. Warrior was still popular with WWF fans, and with WCW firing on all cylinders, Vince McMahon simply couldn't afford to lose superstars who were so over, even if their in-ring work was average at best. Remember too that the Warrior was scheduled to team up with Ahmed Johnson and Shawn Michaels at International Incident, so by sheer coincidence, the WWF now had the chance to reveal a mystery third man for their next pay-per-view. More on that in a moment though, and no, it can't be Glacier because Glacier is debuting this month on Nitro. So, can the King of Hearts get a good match out of the Ultimate Warrior? Let's find out. Owen dives into the ring and he tries to sneak attack the Warrior, but it's no use. Owen gets tossed right outside the ring again, and then we see Ahmed Johnson and HBK via split screen. Sean says they already have their third man and they aren't going to drag it out. A little jab at WCW here, I presume. Ahmed says that this isn't a guy you'd invite over for dinner and all will be revealed very soon. Back inside the ropes, the Warrior delivers a few hip tosses before Owen gets sent over the top rope. Owen gets back inside and he takes more punishment. Warrior even grabs Owen by the hair just to slam him straight back to the mat. Absolute destruction here, Owen isn't getting a chance to do anything as the King of Hearts takes a power slam from the Warrior. It's kind of ridiculous in a way. We all know how good Owen is and his talents are getting completely thrown away here. Lawler and McMahon guess who Sean and Ahmed's partner could be and it ranges from Mr. Perfect to OJ Simpson as the match continues on. And finally, Owen gets in some offense with a spinning wheel kick. Warrior, of course, completely no-sells it and Owen's follow-up clothesline has no effect, but thankfully, Warrior begins running out of warrior powers, and Owen can now bring the pain for all those little warriors that Jim Helwig let down. Owen's flurry lasts all of 10 seconds, Warrior comes firing back and we think it's all over, but Owen gets his knees up when Warrior goes for the splash. Jerry Lawler gets excited as Owen goes back into the driver's seat, he's really happy that this could be the Warrior's final match, and when we come back from commercial break, Owen is mocking his opponent, good stuff here. Owen blows his nose on the Ultimate Warrior before Jim Cornette gets in a cheap shot, and then Owen jumps on his opponent back. The King of Hearts pretends he can't hear the referee when he has to break the hold. It's these really small dirty tactics from Owen Hart that made him so fun to watch. Owen continues to save this train wreck by hitting an enziguri before grabbing his Slammy Award and celebrating in the ring. A missile dropkick from the King of Hearts follows but Warrior kicks out a two. Owen then goes for the sharpshooter, but yeah, Warrior isn't taking any sharpshooters tonight. Davy Boy Smith comes down the ringside as the Warrior begins his comeback routine. Owen Hart gets taken out and Davy jumps into the ring. The ref calls for the bell and the Warrior wins via disqualification. Vader comes down to attack the Warrior and Kemp Cornette ends the segment by totally destroying who they thought would be their opponent at International Incident. Warrior takes a running power slam and a Vader bomb, and after the match, Michaels and Ahmed Johnson are seen backstage teasing their mystery third partner. So it's kinda like, yeah, fuck Warrior, we now have someone who's way better. Jim Powers vs Slick Rick then on Nitro, Jim's best days were very much behind him at this point, with the peak of his career being in the Young Stallions tag team in the World Wrestling Federation, but still, let's see how he did against the new US Champion. 
Bischoff says that he checked in with WCW offices this morning and apparently a bunch of unhappy parents called in to say their kids had been crying because of Hulk Hogan's actions at the bash at the beach. Those little marks need to sort their lives out. Bobby Heenan says that he's told fans this for years and years. Hulk Hogan was never a good person. A headlock takedown from Jim Powers starts things off. Flair comes back with a shoulder block but Jim then hits a back body drop. As Powers delivers headlock takedown too, I couldn't help but notice my man here getting a good look at Miss Elizabeth. He pays zero attention to the match inside the ropes and it's clear that this is a man who has his priorities in order. Good job sir. Jim complains when Rick pulls his hair, so Flair throws Powers out of the ring and Woman gets in a cheap shot. Headlock takedown number 3 from Jim Powers, Flair brings Jim into the corner and the Roman Greco thumb to the eye gets delivered. And then the nature boy brings some punishment in the corner. Jim Powers fights back with some hard knife edge chops, Flair takes another back body drop and then Rick takes a corner bump that sends him to the outside of the ring. Flair then talks a little smack to a fan before dancing with woman and then Flair gets inside the ring and he begs Powers to go easy on him. This is amazing and it's a perfect example of Flair acting on instinct. See a fan? Shout at him. See a woman? Dance with her. See your opponent? Beg for mercy. Rick delivers another thumb to the eye but it gets him nowhere. Flair takes the top rope bump and Jim follows up with a few clotheslines. It only gets a two count. Flair holds onto the ropes when Powers goes for a drop kick and then the nature boy goes after the knee. A chop lock gets followed up with a knee drop and you know what's happening next. Flair wins the match after applying the figure four leg lock. Mean Gene interviews Anderson, Mongo and Flair afterwards and Double A sends a message to Hulk Hogan. Double A says the horsemen never claimed to be role models but Hulk Hogan did. People looked up to the Hulkster but Hogan acted like a thief in the night at the Bash at the Beach show. The Enforcer says this will come back to bite Hogan in the future. Ric Flair then tells the Giant that there's a new champion in town and it's a champion who can go all night long. I really appreciate that Owen tried to make something out of his match with the Ultimate Warrior but it's a point here for Monday Nitro. Craig Pittman goes to war next with Chris Benoit on Nitro while Justin Hawk Bradshaw takes on Savio Vega. Savio gets attacked by Brian Pillman at the entranceway and JJ Dillon has to talk some sense into the loose cannon. The WWF were trying to give Pillman as much exposure as possible without having him actually wrestle a match and eventually Pillman would provide commentary for the WWF Superstars show. It's the Caribbean Strap versus the Texas Bull Rope on Raw. Whoop de doo. Bradshaw brings Savio to the corner, but Vega won't let Bradshaw push him around. Savio gets up in Bradshaw's face, and Bradshaw pushes Vega away. A big hip toss puts Savio in his place, but Bradshaw misses his follow up elbow drop. This allows Vega to fight back and we see that corner spinning wheel kick that Vega does. It's a great move but those WCW cruiserweights are putting things like this to shame. Bradshaw and Vega then start beating the hell out of each other in the corner and Uncle Zebekiah here gets in a cheap shot. This allows Bradshaw to take the lead. Things slow way down as Bradshaw hits a body slam before applying a sleeper hold. Vega eventually breaks out and he hits a flying crossbody but Bradshaw replies with a mean big boot. Give him credit here, this had a lot of impact. The match again slows down as Bradshaw brings Vega back to the mat and the audience are quickly losing interest here. Bradshaw then brings Vega to the corner for a series of knee strikes and on commentary Lawler and McMahon are still speculating about the mystery third man. At this point they were just taking the piss in order to take shots at WCW. It's all silly answers like John Travolta and the Wimbledon streaker of 1996. A bit of miscommunication leads to Savio nearly diving into Bradshaw's asshole head first and Bradshaw thanks Vega with a big leg drop. Another sleeper gets applied and this match is really beginning to test my patience. The men get back to their feet and then Mr. Perfect calls in. Jerry Lawler wants to know if Kurt Hennig is the mystery third partner but Perfect doesn't answer. 
We come back from a commercial break and Bradshaw hits a pump handle slam. Bradshaw then goes to the top rope and he hits a flying shoulder tackle but it only gets him a two count. Savio then reverses a pile driver attempt and this leads to Bradshaw taking a side suplex. Again, it only gets a two count. Eventually, Zebekiah gets on the apron, but Vega chops him down. Zebekiah then inadvertently costs Bradshaw the match when he grabs Vega by the foot when Bradshaw had his lariat lined up perfectly. Vega wins with a spinning wheel kick, and thank God it's over. Zebekiah gets in the ring afterwards, Savio gets hit with the cowbell. Let's just move on. A video aired on Nitro that said our world is about to change, so yeah, this means Glacier isn't showing up this week, but there's still time, I'm not losing faith just yet. Something is slightly concerning though, the graphic at the end of the video, do you notice anything unusual here? They've removed the coming in July message, but I know in my heart that this was just a mistake and they played an old video, I'm not concerned at all. As a matter of fact, I'm more excited for Glacier's debut than ever because you lovely people sent me in a ton, and I mean a ton of Glacier memes, artwork, and even some videos to make Glacier Month even more special. I'll first announce the winners of the competition. I ended up choosing two because I appreciated the effort that both these guys went through, but in saying that, I appreciate everyone who sent something in for Glacier Month. Our first winner is Martin Dixon, who took the time to draw Glacier, and he also coloured his artwork afterwards, and again, I appreciate that this must have took quite some time, so congratulations Martin, good work. And let me present you with the second winner, a video by Millennial Brokan, or Brochan, I'm not sure. When you speak of special events, and we are talking about the anticipation of a man for months that was a coming. I can't wait. I'm, I'm a black belt in Okinawa, which was very fast hey, and direct. Hey. Uh-oh, look at this. The lights have gone down. We are about to see Glacier. This is a special moment. And there he is. Glacier has made his appearance here in the pro arena. And you can really feel it. There is the understanding that this is a moment we'll remember for a long time to come. This guy here has got a big heart. Clearly an extraordinary competitor is Glacier here on the pro. Glacier is absolutely extraordinary. Always at the ready, always watching his opponent. Now up on the third row. Look how quick he is. Oh, man, right in the throat. He stuffed him, guys. Debut of Glacier, victorious here on the pro on TBS tonight. Successful debut. The winners will be contacted soon, so congratulations, guys. Eric Bischoff addresses the New World Order next by saying that WCW will not back down and WCW will fight against Hall, Nash and Hogan. Eric says that WCW has guys like Lex Luger, Sting, Randy Savage, The Giant, Ric Flair and The Horseman and if anyone thinks WCW is going to run away from this new threat, they would be very much mistaken. Bobby Heenan says it's all going to be okay, WCW has a cavalry of top world class superstars and it's time for WCW WCW to fight back. So what chance does Sergeant Craig Pittman have of defeating Chris Benoit? No chance. He has no chance at all. I'm actually a little concerned about the Sergeant seeing as Benoit is now portraying this ruthless and intense physical fighter since the beginning of his rivalry with Kevin Sullivan. And whoa, holy shit, Pittman brings Benoit to the mat after a standing switch. Wasn't expecting that. Benoit then hits the ropes hard and... What the hell? A picture perfect overhead belly to belly suplex from Craig Pittman. Oh, and we aren't done yet. Pittman follows up with a German suplex. Guys, think about this. Sergeant Craig Pittman, in the span of 10 seconds, has won this point for Monday Nitro. I can't even make an argument for the World Wrestling Federation here. Craig Pittman has destroyed the opposition. Craig then goes for another suplex in the corner, but Benoit holds on. The crippler then makes Pittman pay for his crimes by laying in a beating. Benoit even slaps his opponent's head before talking some trash. Pittman gets choked on the top rope and then Benoit brings the fight in the corner. Pittman then manages to Irish whip Benoit, but Chris follows up with a boot to the face followed by a clothesline. 
A headbutt sends Benoit to the outside and the crippler goes after Teddy Long. Pittman then throws Benoit back inside the ropes but Chris takes advantage and we see the crippler crossface. Teddy Long then jumps into the ring and he tells the ref to ring the bell. Teddy Long is throwing in the towel and this means Chris Benoit is our winner. So really Craig Pittman never gave up. Pittman would have fought on and Pittman maybe could have won. Yeah. Still, I was surprised by the sergeant's opening flurry of suplexes, and while this was a very short match, it was also way more entertaining than Vega vs Bradshaw. Another point for WCW. Shawn Michaels and Ahmed Johnson are teasing their mystery partner on Raw, and apparently whoever it is, he's on his way right now. It's then announced that Shawn Michaels will do battle with Billy Gunn next week. Shawn calls Billy the drugstore cowboy. And Ahmed Johnson will go head to head with Bart Gunn next week. Ahmed then calls Billy and Bart silly and fart. I mean, that, that's not even funny. It's like, never mind. Main event time, Arn Anderson vs Sting on Nitro and the fucking Godwin's main event Raw in a match against Davy Boy Smith and Vader. Why? Why would you put on this main event after Bash at the Beach? And yes, I know this is a taped show and I know it was too late to rearrange the remaining taped matches for this particular episode, but a little foresight here would have went a long way. You're in a war against another company who has been destroying your product recently in the ratings and you put Phineas and Henry Godwin in your main event? Thankfully, Jim Cornette is on commentary, so it's not a complete throwaway match, and who knows, I've been wrong before with preconceptions, maybe this could actually be good. Let's try to remain optimistic. <laughs> we see Cornette sitting at the announce table, but as soon as the camera goes back to the ring, we're back to the redubbed commentary. Cornette talks about how happy he is that the warrior got taken out, and he isn't sweating this mystery third partner. Henry takes out the bulldog with a shoulder block to start things off, and Henry also delivers a hip toss to Davy Boy Smith. Vader comes into the match, and Vader gives Henry an absolute beating in the corner. Henry gets a round of applause after hitting a suplex on the big man, and the hog farmer is able to follow up with another shoulder block. Phineas comes in, and we see one of the most graceful and beautiful splashes in WWF history. Good work here. And the referee lets Phineas get away with biting his opponent. Jim Cornette is now sweating at the commentary table as the Bulldog comes back in. Phineas hits a Bulldog on the Bulldog, and it looks like Davey can't be asked tonight as Vader comes back into the match. Vader destroys Phineas with a corner splash and a short arm clothesline. Phineas is then able to get back into his corner and he tags in Henry. Jim Cornette reiterates that he's a happy man tonight because the warrior is gone, and it really does feel like Cornette means every single word he says here. After Vader spends some time beating up Henry, the Bulldog comes back in, and there it is folks, a good old Davy Boy Smith chin lock. Davy then hits a power slam, he delivers a leg drop, <laughs> and then chin lock number two gets applied. Bulldog decides he's done enough again and he tags out, Vader and Henry are in the ring once again, and while Vader continues to destroy his opponent, he's struggling to keep the hog farmer down for a three count. Jim Cornette leaves the commentary table to complain to the referee and Vince McMahon announces that an Undertaker music video will not get played tonight due to time constraints. Vader goes up for the Vader bomb, he hits it across Henry's back and the King and Cornette high five each other. I can finally turn off this episode of Raw but no, Henry kicks out. Davy again shows that he just doesn't want to work tonight when he comes in and he fails to hit a suplex. So afterwards he just tags out and Vader again begins destroying Henry in the corner. Vader throws Henry to the opposite turnbuckles and he goes for a splash, but Henry shows off his strength by grabbing the big man before slamming him to the mat. To be fair, the audience loved this and Cornette's reaction afterwards was absolutely fantastic. Phineas gets tagged in and he cleans house, and the piped in crowd noise is painfully obvious here. The match then comes to an end with Cornette again leaving the commentary table as all four men brawl in the ring. Vader hits Phineas with a clothesline to the back and Davy again shows he can't be asked tonight by ending the match with a power slam. Not even a running power slam, just a power slam. 
painful stuff here from Monday Night Raw. This was just awful. Sting looks pretty dejected after last night's pay-per-view. He gets in the ring and Arn Anderson tries to shake his hand, but Sting won't do it. He's had too much history with the horseman just to forgive everything due to what happened at Bash at the Beach. Sting does give a clean break in the corner after the initial lockup though, and afterwards the Stinger takes Anderson down with a shoulder block. Eric Bischoff then announces that we have company. The outsiders have shown up and Bischoff wants to wait it out to see what happens. Sting and Double A trade hammer locks before Arn throws his opponent out of the ring. Arn then goes for a pile driver on the outside, but Sting reverses with a backdrop. Sting allows Arn to get back in the ring as we take a commercial break. When we come back, Sting is in control. From out of nowhere, Double A fires back with his signature spine buster, but the enforcer can't follow up. Bischoff says that a black limousine has just pulled up to the MGM Studios entranceway. And Eric says there's too many kids here and not enough security. <laughs> what did he really think the NWO were going to do here? Arn is giving his opponent a beating now as a Sting chant breaks out in the audience. Any goodwill between Sting and Anderson seems to be thrown out the window as Arn applies an abdominal stretch. The enforcer cheats by using the ropes for leverage. Sting gets out and he goes for a splash but Arn gets the knees up. Arn is then able to apply a Boston Crab and then we see the limousine sitting by the MGM Studios entranceway. Arn chokes Sting on the middle rope and Double A goes upstairs. Sting manages to hit a jumping clothesline to stop Double A in his tracks and then we see the outsiders walking towards the ring. Once Hall and Nash get to ringside, the action completely stops as both Sting and Double A invite the outsiders in for a fight, even the macho man Randy Savage shows up. Double A then tries to go for a cheap victory but Sting applies the death lock and it's all over, Sting wins via submission. Mean Gene interviews Sting afterwards and Sting says he isn't surprised at what Hogan did last night. When Sting and Savage were travelling on the road, Hogan travelled alone in his limo and Hogan disappeared time and time again to make movies. Sting says that Hogan just made cameo appearances during his time in WCW, but what he did at Bash at the Beach was a mistake. Kids had looked up to Hogan and Hogan told those fans to stick it last night, but Sting tells Hogan that he can stick it. Savage also sends a message to Hulk. The Macho Man tells Hulk to think about the worst thing he can possibly dream of, multiply it by 9 million, and then multiply that by infinity and beyond. Savage must have been having too much fun at Disney here. And what Hogan ends up with will just be a little grain of sand in the Sahara Desert in comparison to what the Macho Man is going to do to the Hulkster. Another easy point for Nitro this week. The mystery third man gets revealed on Raw while Mean Gene interviews the Outsiders on Nitro. You've probably seen this loads of times and it's all thanks to Jim Cornette's reaction here, it's absolute gold. Cornette says Michaels and Johnson are bluffing, after what just happened to the Ultimate Warrior there's no way anyone could go up against Kemp Cornette. All you need to do is watch Jim Cornette on the left hand side when Psycho Sid is revealed as the mystery third partner, absolutely brilliant. Sid says that Shawn Michaels has unleashed him once again and there's no one at all who can save Camp Cornette in the six man tag. Cornette just loses his mind, saying that Sid got locked up because he's a little unstable and Cornette wants Sid removed from the match as Raw comes to an end. Over on Nitro, Mean Gene interviews Hall and Nash and Gene wants to talk about Hogan's heel turn. Nash says WCW took a beating last night and the fans of WCW took a beating because Hulk Hogan told them exactly how it was. Nash says that Hogan built wrestling, WCW fans couldn't appreciate that but the outsiders do. Nash announces that Hogan will be on Nitro next week and Scott Hall says the outsiders did exactly as they promised. They announced their third partner and they beat WCW at Bash at the Beach. Hall says Randy Savage is jealous of Hulk Hogan and Lex Luger didn't get hurt last night, he just fainted when he saw the outsiders in the ring. 
The final point goes to Raw, Cornette losing his mind had so much replayability and the Outsiders really didn't say much except that Hogan will be on Nitro next week. Nitro ends with Eric Bischoff talking us through some pictures from Bash at the Beach. Nitro was simply leagues better than Raw this week. Sometimes scoring segment by segment doesn't give a fair overlook of an entire show, but not this week. Raw was bad while Nitro ranged from good to excellent. Nitro leads our scoreboard then with 21 points, Raw is stuck on 14 points and we've had 5 ties. Nitro also won in the television ratings, it's going to get a little pointless doing this soon. But Nitro scored a 3.5 to Raw's 2.5. Hollywood Hogan is on Nitro next week and he's going to talk about the NWO while HBK and Ahmed Johnson take on Silly and Fart Gun. I hope to see you all again next week and thank you for watching. And now for your viewing pleasure, here's the other entrance for the Glacier Month competition. Again, thanks to everyone who sent something in.